Hello, I'm Marshall Masters, publisher of Yowza.com, and I'm a Planet X system researcher and investigator. In this program, we're going to compare the theories of Planet 7X researcher Gil Broussard with the collective works of Zachariah Sitchin, author of The Twelfth Planet. We've got a lot to cover, so let's get started. Planet X research has always followed along two lines of thought, science and religion. Here at Yowza.com, we focus on the science. However, other researchers pursue it from a religious point of view, notably Gil Broussard, who runs the Planet7x.com website. His take on Planet X is that it is in an orbit of approximately 360 years, and he has a different name for it. He calls it Planet 7X, and his primary research source is the Bible. While that is difference enough, a common concern of those with a Bible agenda is their distrust of Zachariah Sitchin, author of The Twelfth Planet, and his kind. That is why I took note of a recent interview of Gil Broussard by L.A. Marzulli in the video documentary Watchers 9. Days of Chaos from Penlight Productions. Zechariah Sitchin's book, The Twelfth Planet, put Planet X on the map. Do you agree with his findings? No, no, I do not. Okay, that's interesting. Why? <laughs> well, because when we uh, no no one validated uh, validated his uh, his interpretation of the uh, uh, Sumerian text, mm -hmm. and and. When we look closely at the 3600 year orbit, he didn't get that from the Sumerian text. From what I understand, he got it from another source. And if you go back and do the research on it, there's no valid evidence for a 3600 year orbit that was with data. In that interview, Broussard starts out by flatly dismissing Zachariah Sitchin with an unsubstantiated statement of fact. No one validated his interpretation of the Sumerian text. Had Broussard simply said that he does not agree with Sitchin, I would have not taken issue. However, using an unsubstantiated statement of fact to demean a lifetime of careful work by a man who has been dead for five years is quite another thing. This cannot stand. For this reason, I contacted Watcher's producer Richard Shaw to ask if he or L.A. Marzulli had researched Broussard's claims. Richard said he had not, because this is not his job. His job is to get all the different voices, meaning viewpoints, out there so others can do their own research. He also pointed out that I have been featured in the Watcher's series several times and that he has never researched my claims as well. Point taken. Richard is doing his job. Nonetheless, Broussard's unsubstantiated statement of fact in the Watchers 9 interview demeaned the reputation of a man who's been dead for five years and who can no longer defend himself nor his valuable body of research. I pointed that out to Richard and Consequently, he let me air the entire Broussard interview from Watchers 9. All he asked for was a professional response to Broussard. I agreed, and Richard then gave me a secure access to download the segment, so I could start working on this response. Richard Shaw and I have been great friends for many years, and his integrity and art are above reproach. So his request for a professional response got me to thinking. You may be wondering as well, 
given that I have chosen to defend the work of a renowned scholar who is no longer with us, where do I begin? In answer to that question, here is where I have a certain advantage. And that advantage is to be found in the year 2002. On January 28, 2002, I published my first article on Planet X titled, Did Planet X Nibiru Kill the Dinosaurs? Following the publication of this article, we began receiving a lot of email from people about a catastrophic flyby of Planet X predicted by Nancy Leader of the Zeta Talk website and author Mark Hazelwood, who wrote the book Blindsided. Both were predicting a catastrophic flyby in the summer of 2003. Of course, we looked into it. Our review of the data told us that this was a red herring prediction by both Leader and Hazelwood, and reported that in our article titled Planet X Flyby in 2003, Zeta Hysteria versus Zeta Fact, published on February 23, 2002. Looking back, it was a dark time for Planet X research because so many people were needlessly panicked. Frankly, it broke our hearts to see people ready to sell everything they had and to run to the hills in a non-event stampede. We saw it that way, and interestingly enough, so did Zachariah Sitchin. And that was when the phone rang. It was a pleasant April Sunday following a long party night. And at 8 o'clock in the morning, I was groping around for the phone, found it, and put it to my ear. Hello, I'm Zachariah Sitchin from New York. I got your number from a mutual friend. Do you have a moment? Talk about a cinematic moment. I leapt out of bed and said, what can I do for you? Sitchin then explained that he was deeply upset by the Nancy leader, Mark Hazelwood, panic because he had recently published his book, The Lost Book of Enki which many believed was fanning the flames of this Zeta hysteria. If Sitchin had been in it for the money, he wouldn't have said anything, because in fact, the Zeta hysteria was bolstering sales of his latest book, The Lost Book of Enki. To his credit, Zachariah Sitchin wanted to end this red herring panic, no matter what it cost him personally. It wasn't about the money for him, it was about the truth. And so he offered to give me an exclusive interview for Yowza.com. I accepted his offer. I chose Yowza.com co-founder Steve Russell as the lead for the article interview because he had read all of Sitchin's available work. Steve also prepared a list of questions for me for the interview and then wrote an article titled Planet X Nibiru, Zeta Talk, and Mission Enterprise, which we published on May 25, 2002, to announce our forthcoming interview with Sitchin. In that article, Steve noted, The Nibiru in 2003 debate shifted into high gear with Sitchin's latest book, The Lost Book of Enki, which caused a lot of public interest. Also in that article, we promised our readers that we would publish an exclusive interview with Zachariah Sitchin in the following week. As it turned out, that promise was a bit too optimistic. You see, I had promised Sitchin editorial control on the article to make sure it would be accurate. How was I to know this man was so fastidious when it came to dotting his I's and crossing his T's, so to speak? And after the fourth edit cycle, it was time to make a publishing decision. So I called Zachariah and I asked him, does this fourth version present your work accurately? He said, yes. I said, are there any misstatements in it? He said, no. But that he wanted to do a little more tweaking. I said, well, we're going to press. That ship has sailed. And he was actually rather nice about it and accepted that. And so, we went to press. On June 1, 2002, we published his interview titled, Will Planet X Nibiru Return in 2003? Always the gentleman, 
Sitchin did not humiliate Nancy Leader or Mark Hazelwood with a scathing attack, as I had first anticipated. Rather, he put the whole issue of a 2003 flyby to rest in a dignified and elegant way when, towards the end of the article, he said, Also, the assumption that the 3,600 years as a perfect mathematical given is also at all times the actual orbital period is untenable. All attempts to pinpoint a precise date for future arrivals of the planet and or of the Anunnaki are thus difficult questions. I am proud to say that I worked with Zachariah Sitchin on that project and a few others because he was always so conscientious and so courteous. With that in mind, let's watch Gil Broussard as he answers L.A. Marzulli in the Watchers 9 documentary. Zechariah Sitchin's book, The Twelfth Planet, put Planet X on the map. Do you agree with his findings? No, no I do not. Okay, that's interesting, why? <laughs> well, because when we, uh, no, no one validated, uh, validated his, uh, his interpretation of the uh, uh, Sumerian text. Mm -hmm is the unsubstantiated claim that no one validated his interpretation of the Sumerian text appropriate or professional, given that Broussard presents himself as a researcher. I maintain the position that it was not, and so do many Yowza.com readers, who have contacted me to voice their disappointment over this interview. This is because there has been a long-standing academic discussion of Sitchin's work from many points of view, both for and against. Those against principally come from a fundamentalist viewpoint, such as leading Sitchin cynic Dr. Michael S. Heiser, author of The Unseen Realm, Recovering the Supernatural Worldview of the Bible. Keep in mind, men such as Heiser and Broussard form a small but very vocal group of religious cynics opposed to Sitchin. On the other hand, Sitchin has millions of supporters all around the world who have read his books and who are impressed by his level of academic authenticity. One such man is author Lloyd Pye, whose book Everything You Know Is Wrong was a bestseller. A man of science, he vetted Sitchin's translations and then devoted an entire chapter of his book to them. Like so many others who have actually read Sitchin's books, Pai was saddened when Sitchin passed away in 2010 and wrote this brilliant article titled In Defense of Zachariah Sitchin. With that in mind, what about Lloyd Pai? Is he a reliable source? I maintain that he is. Lloyd was a guest on my Cut to the Chase program twice, first in 2004 and then again in 2005. We then stayed in touch over the years, and it deeply saddened me when he passed away in 2013. But more to the point, Broussard's unsubstantiated comment about Sitchin, no one validated his interpretation of the Sumerian text, raises a pertinent question. Is Broussard being intentionally misleading? I am not a professional translator, so I pondered that at length. This brings me back to Richard Shaw's request for a professional response to Broussard. So let me be clear about this. I am doing this response to stand up for a man who is one of my personal heroes and for one of the reasons stated by L.A. Marzulli in this interview. Zechariah Sitchin's book, The Twelfth Planet, put Planet X on the map. I replayed the clip of L.A. Marzulli's comment on Sitchin many times, and it really resonated with me. And it reached out to me with a message that I stand upon the shoulders of a man who devoted his life to this work. So then, what to do now? That was the question on my mind when I went to bed that evening. And in the wee hours of the morning, I woke up and well, just couldn't sleep. 
So I went out and sat in my favorite chair in the dark with that one question on my mind. What to do? What to do? And then I heard that small voice within saying to me, What is Broussard doing? It was an electric moment for me because it offers a level playing field on Broussard's own terms. With that in mind, I am now going to show you each of the questions I saw arising from Broussard's statements in this interview with L.A. Marzulli. One of the first things you see when you visit Broussard's website is his tagline, See How Science Confirms Biblical Research. This raises the first question. If Broussard is using science as proof of a religious point of view, how can science confirm Broussard's biblical research? So I began this task by downloading a large PDF file from Broussard's site titled Timeline. And here is the first slide. The first thing I noticed upon close examination is that the text is embedded within the graphics and cannot be extracted. In other words, it is presented as a fait accompli. This brings us back to his tagline, see how science confirms biblical research. And our question, how can science confirm Broussard's biblical research? Given the manner in which he presents his material, this raises a question of science. Where does he publish his white papers, journals, lab notes, other sources he's researched, and other documents essential to a scientific peer review of his work. This is a very fair question because Broussard raises the issue of peer review with his unsubstantiated statement. No one validated his interpretation of the Sumerian text. Ergo, Broussard made the rules, and as the old saying goes, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. I like these rules because as a Planet X researcher, I want people to search for the truth in their own way and in their own good time. But Broussard apparently does not, so this raises two relevant questions. The first is, is Broussard using misdirection to avoid an independent peer review of his own work? The second is, why is peer review necessary? I'll let Broussard broach the answer in his own words. When we look closely at the 3600 year orbit, he didn't get that from the Sumerian text. From what I understand, he got it from another source. Let's look closely at what Broussard just stated in this clip. Quote, when we look closely at the 3600 year orbit, he didn't get that from the Sumerian text, from what I understand, he got it from another source." End quote. The crucial key to understanding Broussard's view of the scientific peer review process is capsulized in the second sentence. Quote, from what I understand, he got it from another source. End quote. What Broussard did not say is that he knows this for a fact because he personally researched it. Rather, he attributes an undisclosed source. So who is this mysterious source? And why doesn't Broussard share his name with us? These are troubling questions because they indicate an outright admission of hearsay evidence. This is a crucial omission because hearsay evidence is the first thing an objective peer review process will eliminate. But is this a fair criticism? Remember, it is Broussard who invokes science with his tagline, see how science confirms biblical research. And to be fair, if you are to invoke science to support your position, it is likewise incumbent upon you to be respectful of the peer review process. Therefore, we have another pertinent question. Is Broussard's use of hearsay evidence against Sitchin good science? While that question is paramount for me, it's not the question my readers ask most. 
What they ask is, how can Broussard say with any certainty that Planet X, or Planet 7X as he calls it, is in a 360-year orbit, whereas Zachariah Sitchin puts it in a 3,600-year orbit? We need to examine Broussard's statement very carefully. Why? Because he presents it as a statement of fact. If you go back and do the research on it, there's no valid evidence for a 3,600-year orbit. And I quote, If you go back and do the research on it, there's no valid evidence for a 3,600-year orbit. End quote. With this unsubstantiated statement in mind, I began a close examination of the timeline file I downloaded from Broussard's site. That was when I found something that caught my eye as a Planet X researcher on slide 42 of Broussard's timeline file. If you look in the upper right hand corner, you will see that he cites U.S. Naval Observatory astronomer Dr. Robert Harrington as a source in support of his position. In other words, he is using Harrington to bolster the credibility of his 360-year orbit. But, is that truly the case? Carrington died in 1993 under very unusual circumstances, and many Planet X researchers believe he was assassinated for his work on Planet X. In particular, an August 1990 interview with Zachariah Sitchin for a documentary titled are we alone in the universe? In that interview, Harrington discusses his white paper, The Location of Planet X. Here you see him pointing to an orbital illustration for Planet X he created, which supports Sitchin's 3600-year orbit, not Broussard's 360-year orbit, even though Broussard uses Harrington to bolster his position. So, is this a one-off situation, or has any other professional astronomer come out in support of Sitchin's 3,600-year orbit? Yes, Chilean astronomer Carlos Muñoz Ferrada first put forward his explanation of Planet X in 1940, and here you see him pointing at an orbit illustration of his own making, which does indeed support Sitchin's 3,600-year orbit. This brings us back to Broussard's statement of fact, and I quote, If you go back and do the research on it, there's no valid evidence for a 3,600-year orbit, end quote. With that in mind, what's the final tally? Two professional astronomers support Sitchin's 3,600-year orbit. No professional astronomers support Broussard's 360-year orbit. However, of more concern to me as a Planet X researcher is Broussard's misuse of Robert Harrington as a credible source in support of his 360-year orbit. This bait-and-switch misuse raises pertinent doubts about Broussard's credibility. So, let's take a closer look at Broussard the man. On his website, Broussard presents himself as an amateur astronomer, a designer, and a researcher. So for the purpose of this analysis, we'll confine it to how Broussard defines himself within the context of this interview with L.A. Marzulli. Therefore, we begin with Broussard, the amateur astronomer. Over the years, countless people have sent image researchers like myself and Richard Shaw of uh, Pinlight Productions numerous photographs of what they believe to be Planet X. Consequently, we've both become adept at screening these images, most of which tend to be lens flares. In fact, we often collaborate on images that we feel are of interest, which tend to be about one in a hundred. And so we are continually talking to each other as image analysts. As such, we employ the language of image analysis on a continuing basis. Keeping this in mind, look once again at this brief excerpt of Broussard. As you do, ask yourself, 
Does this man sound like he is doing image analysis on a continual basis? There are no surface features as though topography in any of these so-called sightings on the net. What are your thoughts? Yeah, at the moment there is no valid uh, sightings of Planet X in the public realm at the moment. Most of that is called sun, uh, sun dogs or lens, lens, lens flares. Lens flare and maybe a few other anomalies that we may have another technical name. As someone who does image analysis on a continual basis, this snippet really raises a question is Broussard even looking? However, as a Planet X researcher, what really sent up a red flag to me was the first term he used, sundogs. Back in 2008, the term sundog worked its way into the public lexicon as a knee-jerk explanation for any alleged photograph of Planet X. And in March of 2009, we published an article titled Observing Planet X Nibiru, explaining this very term to our readers. In that article, we state the term sundog is used to identify a bright, mostly circular object near the sun, or perhaps a bright spot inside a solar halo. So what does a sundog really look like? As you can see here, sun dogs are beautiful things to behold. I've been fortunate enough to see one myself, and they're so magnificent, pictures just don't seem to do them justice. Unfortunately, there are only a few sparsely populated regions of the country where you can see sun dogs, and so most people have no idea of what a sun dog is or what it looks like. However, Sundogs is a catchy term, which brought it to the attention of disinformation operatives who saw its value in terms of neurolinguistic programming, or what is commonly referred to as NLP. Like many things in science, there is good and bad, and NLP is no different. For the good, it is used in a positive way for psychological therapy, and in a negative way, for propaganda mind control. Once disinformationalists began spinning the term sundog, it quickly propagated throughout the internet. Consequently, sundog became a dismissive NLP trigger word. The instant people heard it or read it, their programmed minds were triggered with an immediate, nothing to see here, move along response. It is this bit of history that now raises two very pertinent questions. First, why does amateur astronomer Broussard use an outdated NLP trigger word? And second, why does amateur astronomer Broussard forget and fumble the term lens flare? Most of that is called sun, uh, sun dogs or lens, 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 flares? lens flare, and maybe a few other anomalies that we may have another technical name. Now we come to the question that starts every conversation I have with other Planet X researchers about Broussard. Everyone asks the same question. Did Broussard really do these graphics himself? And if not, who did? Broussard answers that question on his site by presenting himself as a designer. Fair enough, that is, providing he can back up that claim. With that in mind, let's return to his interview with L.A. Marzulli. You know, I've gone online and looked at, looked at Elwell's research and Fletcher's and, of course, your research, which is incredible. Your presentation is, is, is amazing. The graphics are just stellar. When Marzulli said, your presentation is amazing, he was echoing what many others have said about Broussard's artwork, which is truly stunning. In fact, desktop artwork like this goes far beyond what any amateur can do. Nonetheless, as a Planet X researcher, I am not swayed by style. This is because beauty is skin deep. In other words, style means nothing. What matters is the substance. With this in mind, let's take a substantive look at Broussard's artwork. Broussard's 
style over substance presentation method resembles full color children's books for elementary readers. This tells me that whoever designed these graphics has been professionally schooled and has experience in producing color books for the home and library markets. As a Planet X researcher, I see that he uses sophisticated graphics without exposing underlying facts and research information that would allow traditional scientific peer review. Therefore, on a substantive level, his style over substance work is beautiful to behold, but it only allows you to take it on faith, or not. Now we come to the question about Broussard's work. Did Broussard actually do these graphics himself? And if not, who did? This is a relevant question because as a book publisher since 2003, I've worked with numerous graphics design artists over the years. This level of work is what you expect to see from a major publisher like Simon & Schuster or a Penguin Random House. An art like this can cost at least $500 per graphic. In the timeline file that I downloaded from Broussard's site, he had 52 such illustrations, which conservatively means that it would have cost someone like myself at least $26,000 in contracting fees to produce. Keep in mind, Broussard presents himself as a designer, so as someone who is doing artwork at this high professional level, I know that as a publisher he must have an online portfolio and a list of clients and or projects. So I went on the search engines, Google, Bing and Yahoo and entered the following search strings. Gil Broussard Art, Gil Broussard Artist, Gil Broussard Designer, Gil Broussard Graphics, and Gil Broussard Portfolio. Nothing turned up. I could not find any online portfolio or list of clients. Broussard only states on his website and social media sites that he is a designer. Remember, work at this level requires years of training and genuine talent. So, the absence of an online portfolio does not make sense, given the level of skill shown in the work. Therefore, we must ask, Is Gil Broussard a trained and certified graphics design artist? If so, who are his commercial clients and where can we see his portfolio? Or, can Gil Broussard prove to impartial independent observers his Adobe Photoshop graphics design skills? If not, exactly who did the artwork and exactly who paid for it? Now we come to the final question and one frankly that is most perplexing for me as a Planet X researcher and investigator. How did Gil Broussard come to coin the term Planet 7X? With that, let's return to his interview with L.A. Marzulli. Why do you call Planet X P7X? I want to think it qualifies the size of it, between six and a half being about seven times the diameter of Earth. Until we have a, uh, an actual sighting, then we can scale it using optics. Keep in mind, Broussard presents himself as a researcher. And so, as a fellow researcher, I reviewed the explanation he gave Marzulli with keen interest. With that in mind, let's take a close look at the quandary I routinely see in reader emails. Planet X versus Planet 7X. To resolve this quandary, let's first examine the substance behind the term Planet X, and then we'll examine the substance behind Broussard's term Planet 7X. Planet X is a long-standing term used by astronomers to describe an undiscovered planet in the outer solar system. The history of the term dates back to the discovery of Uranus, the first planet to be discovered with a telescope. It was first sighted in 1690 by John Flamsteed, but mistaken for a star. However, in 1781, it was correctly discovered as a planet by Sir William Herschel. After Herschel's discovery of Uranus, astronomers were able to observe complete orbits of the planet, 
and what they saw was a perturbation in the orbit of Uranus. At this point, astronomers knew that an undiscovered large planet beyond the orbit of Uranus was responsible for this perturbation. This is actually when the term Planet X first came into limited use. Planet X meaning an unknown planet. And so the search for the mysterious Planet X began. And it would result in the discovery of another major body in our system, not with a telescope, but with mathematics. This is because the planet Neptune was mathematically predicted before it was directly observed. In 1845, astronomers Urbain Le Verrier and John Couch Adams used perturbations in the orbit of Uranus to calculate the location of Neptune, and in 1846 it was observed with a telescope by astronomer Johann Gall. After the discovery of Neptune, astronomers were able to observe the planet, and to their surprise, they observed a perturbation in the orbit of Neptune, just like that of Uranus. At this point, astronomers knew that there was yet an undiscovered large planet beyond the orbits of Uranus and Neptune, causing these orbital perturbations. It was about then that the search for Planet X moved from Europe to the United States. In 1894, wealthy Bostonian Percival Lowell founded the Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona. According to Wikipedia, Lowell's greatest contribution to planetary studies came during the last decade of his life, which he devoted to the search for Planet X, a hypothetical planet beyond Neptune. Although Lowell did not discover Pluto, Lowell Observatory did, however, in March and April of 1915. However, it was in 1930 when Clyde William Tombaugh of the Lowell Observatory was officially credited with the discovery of Pluto, which at the time was assumed to be the planet X that is perturbing the orbits of Uranus and Neptune. That assumption was proven wrong with the 1978 discovery of Pluto's moon, Charon. This discovery allowed astronomers to accurately determine the size of Pluto. What the data showed is that Pluto is less than one-fifth the size of Earth. In fact, it is so small, our moon is bigger than Pluto. What this 1978 discovery clearly shows is that Pluto lacks the mass necessary to perturb the orbits of Uranus and Neptune. Consequently, in 2006, the International Astronomical Union, IAU, reclassified Pluto as a member of the new dwarf planet category, and Pluto lost its status as the ninth planet. This was a big disappointment for the public, and in particular, for those who define planet X as being planet number 10, where X stood for the Roman numeral 10, as they often and incorrectly cite it. Ergo, that red herring went extinct in 2006 as well. So, that is how the term planet X came to be, and why it remains the historically correct term for our field of study. Now, let's move on to Broussard's term, Planet 7X. Is it the same? No. Broussard is talking oranges, and everyone else is talking apples. And to see why, let's go back to his interview with L.A. Marzulli. Why do you call Planet X P7X? One thing, it qualifies the size of it, between six and a half being about seven times the diameter of Earth. Until we have a, an actual sighting, then we can scale it using optics. According to Broussard, Planet 7X is 6.5 to 7 times the size of the Earth. Is this feasible? Yes, it is. A large, rocky exoplanet, Kepler-10c, has 17 times the mass of the Earth. Therefore, a rocky planet, 6.5 to 7 times the size of the Earth, is possible. However, it is important to note that all other Planet X researchers estimate the size of Planet X to be 
four to six times the size of the Earth. But then again, size only matters if you can prove it. So, can Broussard prove the size of Planet X with as much certainty as these lucky two anglers? No. In fact, in this interview with L.A. Marzulli, Broussard says, and I quote, Until we have an actual sighting, then we can scale it using optics. End of quote. Keep in mind that according to Broussard, there have been no actual sightings of Planet 7X and no credible observations of Planet X. Yeah, at the moment, there is no valid uh, sightings of Planet X in the public realm at the moment. Therefore, we must ask, does any object with no actual sighting or observations merit an authoritative scientific designation? If not, did Broussard invent the term Planet 7X to sow confusion? This brings us back to the very first question L.A. Marzulli asked Broussard in this Watchers 9 interview. Zechariah Sitchin's book, The Twelfth Planet, put Planet X on the map. Do you agree with his findings? No. No, I do not. Okay, that's interesting. Why? <laughs> well, because when we, uh, no, no one validated, uh, validated his, uh, his interpretation of the uh, uh, Sumerian text. Mm -hmm. With that in mind, I now want to present you with a simple table to illustrate the differences between Gil Broussard's work and my own. The designation I use for my field of study is Planet X. Broussard's is Planet 7X. The term Planet X is based in science. The term Planet 7X is not. My focus of research is on a mini constellation which we call the Planet X system. It features a brown dwarf, which is a binary twin to our own star, with its own constellation of planets and moons. Broussard is talking about a single object. My principal source is science. Broussard's principal source is the Bible. Will we see a catastrophic flyby of the Planet X system in our lifetime? My answer is an emphatic yes. Broussard offers a somewhat conditional maybe. And with regard to planning and preparation, if you're not already doing it today, begin today. Broussard's take on planning and preparation is a conditional maybe. In closing, what I want to say to you personally is that this is just not an academic debate. This is because your life and the lives of your loved ones hang in the balance. So letting someone sway you into procrastination when you should be actively planning and preparing could have some very nasty results. And I'll leave it on that note. So until the next time we meet, remember Marshall's motto. Destiny comes to those who listen and fate finds the rest. So learn what you can learn. Do what you can do, and never give up hope. This is Marshall, and I'll catch you on the backside.